This video is not made for kids. It's designed to be suitable for all audiences, but quite frankly, the FTC scares me. So this video is an adult's perspective on Prodigy and a review from that perspective and for other adults and parents, but not necessarily parents. Hello and welcome back to another Prodigy review, the first part of the mid-season finale as opposed to the quarter-season finale. Yes, a moral star, which apparently features the diviner. I expect this video, there's a decent chance it'll go out pretty late, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the intro. But uh, I, I do know one thing about this episode in advance, and that was a tweet Aaron made that he thought this episode would make cosplayers run to their snow sewing sets. Not their snowing sets, their sewing sets. I thought we were going to get the new uniform. I actually know why, because I, I saw the clip of the cosplay character on Twitter, or rather an image, F of all the dumb reasons of avoiding social media till I watch these, to tweet that if you Google Wordle, you get a special doodle. <laughs> oh, and apparently, actually, I'm the only person in the universe who disliked the last episode, Time Amok. Everyone else seems to think that it was one of, if not the best, time travel plots that Star Trek has ever produced, which I feel just proves my point, because again, According to the story, as the episode explained it, there was no time travel. But it's nice to see a completely civil comments section, uh, even a bit of discussion back and forth. But mostly people still seem to enjoy the video. It did quite well. So it's nice to see at least the Prodigy community. I can do negative reviews, which usually don't do go too well, and I usually don't do them because I like the shows. But hey, it's nice to see people who actually want to hear my opinion, regardless of what it is. But yes, anyways, let's enjoy and start watching Goth Janeway go on adventures. Nope. No, I can't do it. I can't accept it. There are some things that you just can't accept, and that's one of them. Just before this screen, right? I went and I was like, this... Did I miss that this was a double-length episode? And I looked at it, and it said 22 minutes. And no. I'm sorry, there's clearly something wrong with Paramount Plus because that was not 22 minutes. That was like 35 minutes minimum. <laughs> that was that was incredible. That's the beauty of episodic television, isn't it? Last episode, I mean, everyone's going to disagree apparently, but was a dud. Very bad dud. That was a bad episode. And it didn't ruin the series. It didn't ruin what came before. It sure as hell didn't ruin what came after what I just watched. And that was, that was incredible. Gripping from beginning to end, not a dull moment, and as I said, I refuse to accept that that was 22 minutes. I really have been impressed, not just with Prodigy, um, but with Lower Decks, both the 22 minute shows, at how many episodes just don't feel 22 minutes. They feel like full length. To the point where even knowing this was a two-parter, I'm like, is this a two-parter of double length episodes? It was... Where do I begin? Legitimately, I've just cut like about 20 seconds of me trying to figure out where to begin. There's a reason the entire writer's room was credited for writing this episode. It just had so much and it was so well executed. I've learned from Aaron, who I've credited before as a prodigy head. I don't think that's true. I think he's just a very active writer. In fact, he's the last name on the list in the list of writers for this episode. Might have been alphabetical. I wasn't paying attention. But anyway, um, they all worked very hard on this and it shows. That was undoubtedly the best finale- hang on lower decks. That was undeniably the, the best episode, uh, the best finale of any modern Star Trek series. I mean, of course, acknowledging it's part one and a mid-series, but that, you know what? <laughs> it was great. It had a lot as well. Um, Chekhov's gun, of course, a technical term, where they did the switch with Gwen, and, you know, they had the this, this scene and everything. It was like, I'm, I'm kind of wondering for the last scene, like, well, what was the original plan? <laughs> you know, I, I kind of get maybe you'd abandon it. But then even like the, the jetpacks they had, they were looking at in the little montage, they were messing with the jetpacks. Having Murph be in Zero is great. I even noticed the scene earlier when they were walking towards the Diviner. One of them picked up Zero or pushed them or something. He, he was pretty lifeless in kind of that whole scene, obviously, because he was Murph. I thought they might do a bit where um, he was actually out of his shell in like the pure Medusan form, um, but they didn't go with that. It makes sense because, you know, then he can't interact with anyone, but I thought maybe that would be some sort of plot device. I mean, loads of things were set up. Murph being indestructible came back, but does he feel pain? <laughs> we finally have thematically the crew putting on the uniform. Um, we'll get into the uniform, but of course symbolizing like how they've become Starfleet essentially. Maybe not in rank, but in value, which 
I mean, is really what matters, isn't it? Goth Janeway, which of course I look forward to seeing at any convention. And of course, it wasn't just the writing. The music, of course, the themes, the visual work, the CGI work um, was great. You had loads of great crimes. I like those. One I actually wrote down because I didn't want to forget and I didn't because it was good with Jenk and Bog. The why does it feel like we've lost because we did the right thing? I was just like, oh, <laughs> been a while since I've heard a line of Star Trek. Just might be go. Dang, that was a good line. Because, of course, it's not going to be universally true, but that's not the point. Especially, again, from the perspective of a kid's show. It's the doing the right thing isn't always the easy thing, essentially. It's that lesson. It was just like a... Uh, I can see the slew of seven-year-olds in the playground who just see something wrong and just in their head go, no, you know what? Why does it feel like we lost? Because I'm going to do the right thing. And then, I don't know, what, what kind of injustices do seven-year-olds face? <laughs> they stop that one kid from hogging the tetherball? Cool. I don't know, but it's it's great. You even had an acknowledgement. Um... Not quite casual alien racism, but also of the, I don't know, well, it was Jank and Pog's later line right at the end. It's like, speaking of, I don't know, something, something, something. And then Zero's like, ah, oh, yes. Jokes that just enhance my insecurities about how my true inference causes people to go insane or whatever. Paraphrasing. Yeah, it, it's the exactly the kind of scene that original series didn't have between Bones and Spock. Where Bones was a complete and utter racist, and I don't like Bones. I mean, I think I've gone into it elsewhere in the channel, but he's just unforgivably racist at points. And if you don't believe me, try trans- I'm not gonna do it in a Prodigy video. Try translating some of his green-blooded pointed ears into actual racial slurs and then tell me that Bones is an acceptable person. <laughs> All right, I had to stop for a bit because my roommate came in. I'm I'm off the high-high of that episode. Uh, it was still pretty recent though. But yeah, I mean a lot of things really did come together. Um, the Kobayashi Maru came back and actually is a great example of the Kobayashi Maru test then taken into practice. You know, the, the Kobayashi Maru is kind of more abstract. Save the people and risk a war with the Klingons or let them die and don't go to war with the Klingons. Like, raise your hands if you're going to be in a scenario like that. Probably none of my audience and very few people in general. But then this with the uh, Kobayashi Maru only being, what, three episodes ago is a great application of it where again i suppose you'd never be in essentially a hostage situation but it's a much more taking those lessons down to then dal's personal level like this is the kind of thing you can get to and the whole situation as well was quite interesting it was one where for the first well, i mean again hard to judge time but maybe like five ten minutes uh basically the whole planning thing i was just kind of sitting there and every now and then i'm like oh no this is like a harder situation i'm glad they brought up the self-destruct um, I was going to let it slide as, uh, you know, the, the crew don't, aren't too familiar with their ship now, but it's nice to see that they are getting there. You know, they, they, they've put on a uniform again. They are, they're knowing their ship and they're becoming more Starfleet. But yeah, it was like, you know, obviously you don't go back to the Diviner. It was like, if you don't, then like, basically I'll kill all the miners is the threat, you know? And it's like, ugh, that is definitely a harder problem. You gotta go. And it's like, well, yeah, you can't give him the protostar, and ignoring the self-destruct, I was like, even if you do return, you know, he's still probably gonna kill everyone anyway, which he did. <laughs> he did end up doing. And, and it really is like one of those, yeah, there's no real answer here. The proper Kobayashi Maru. And of course, the solution, as I've said, the lesson of the Kobayashi Maru is I don't believe in no-win scenarios. The lesson is to then, we'll create another option. <laughs> Madam President? I mean, yeah, if, if the second part can manage to keep up that level, which... I don't see why not. It'll be one of the best finales in Star Trek's history. I do want to say, though, um, I was afraid they were going to get too much into it. I, I have my own fan theory about the Diviner. Did I talk about this? I don't remember if I talked about it last episode. If I did, you can skip it. If you haven't seen it, you can listen. Kind of combining some stuff I've read on Reddit in my own theories, where basically the, the Diviner and Chakotay, the Federation, were working together originally. You know, there's Diviner language data in the computer banks, and Chakotay is our big archaeologist. I think I might have talked about this. He's an archaeologist guy. That's one of his hobbies among the Voyager inconsistent characterization. That was one of the pretty common threads. Our other big um, archaeologist, Admiral Jean-Luc Picard, is 
depending on when the protostar launched kind of busy dealing with the, the romulan supernova i did talk about this didn't i because that's when i got into the debate of are they from the, the future but anyway i think this is solidifying a lot of that where he's like no nah, starfleet stands for treachery and betrayal and whatnot and it was basically my my thinking is it's a classic premise of um you know bad guy was working with good guy to get Kind of like the Iconian gateways, you know, some ancient powerful thing or whatever. Chakotay and the Federation wanted it for, I don't know, research, study, whatever. But the Diviner wants it for some sort of probably good means, but going about it the wrong way. You know, he'd gone too far. And so Chakotay had to stop him, betrayal, but the Diviner lost the protostar. He needs it to get to the data yada yada i really hope i've described this before in another episode but i think that lays out the general theme and there was a lot that hinted at that you know he's talking about his mission he's going for a specific mission he clearly has history with starfleet again the robot is able to just override Gen janeway like the robot clearly knows this system a uh, dread dreadnoughts i think it is he clearly knows the protostar and yeah i i would be surprised if that wasn't it again it's it's a very high level description you know, that plot, so you can change the edges a bit. Um, people on Reddit have suggested for variation of that maybe there's a third party involved, some sort of evil third party, and the Diviner's not actually evil. Um, you know, he's more complex. I definitely think they're going that way. You can't be a show that makes me think of Steven Universe this much and not have just an objectively bad villain. Well, I say that, I mean, kind of like in Dukat. How Dukat's you know, he's bad, but he's not evil kind of thing. I make comments like that sometimes, and I, I just think about the future where I have a mega fan base, and like the co I'm like, that's just the episode that gets hundreds of comments sparking Dubot, Dugat conversations and debates. One day I will wield such power, but not today. Anyway, I'm gonna get into the scene by scene, because I think there's gonna be a lot to get into. And again, it, it tends to help organize my thoughts when I start rambling. I plan to make a comment about the intro where I kind of realized that Star Trek X, uh, Prodigy has a rather unmemorable title sequence, and I don't really know it. As I was thinking that in my head, trying to get this right frame, I realized I was like humming along the Prodigy theme tune. I'm like, okay, actually, I do know it. It's nice to see Rock Croc's isolation from the last episode didn't go completely ignored, um, I get she kind of enthusiastically explain it because she can talk to people for the first time in years. But I, I don't know, it still needs, like, they should have committed or they need to commit in the future that that affects this probably no longer eight-year-old girl. If you want to know my thoughts on all that, last episode, probably an iCard in the description. Well, it's always in the description, the previous episode, but, um, yeah, I won't go into that here again. Hang on, furthering my theory that last episode was a bad episode... Why didn't he just kind of transmit this message to the protostar? I guess you could say the goal was to probably capture the protostar, and if that failed, then transmit the message? I probably would have done it the other way, though. Transmit the message. If they don't show up, then transmit the robot. So you're not doing the hostile act before the peaceful, where then they wouldn't trust you. You'd try the peaceful act. They might trust you. And if that doesn't work, you try the hostile action. Because, yeah, when Dreadnought shows up on the ship, he immediately tries to take it over. He doesn't be like, hey, I have a message. He tries to take it over, learns about the problem, then tries to fix the ship. Be like, at no point... Guys, come on, it's like the Sound of Thunder. Last episode was not a b good episode, it was a bad episode, and it's the anti-Spock's brain, right? That was an amazing episode, Spock's brain. You're all wrong. But I think we can all agree that Shades of Grey just sucks. The idea of going to the Federation was really interesting and raises a lot of potential for Prodigy, like, are they just gonna go to the Federation? after this. I mean, they can do it. I don't see why they wouldn't after this episode, unless the next 10 they're in, like, constant threat or something. I, I could see stars start going, yeah, screw it, you know, you can have the protostar. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but when is Starfleet always made sensible decisions? But, like, there's a point that, yeah, apparently, as the writers are doing Prodigy, Starfleet can just get to this part of the quadrant without difficulty. Yeah, it'd take them a little bit, at least. Well, more than a day, definitely. I mean, it, it sounds like they're still using traditional warp. Picard still uses traditional warp. It makes sense. It's weird they're calling them jumps, like Discovery does, even though they're still warping. They're not jumping. They're just going really fast. It's supposed Discovery, which uh, teleports, essentially. But I don't know, watching that, I was wondering, like, are they actually bringing in the Federation? It feels a bit weird from Prodigy's goal, but if you think of a structure of Prodigy, 
which is, you know, one of the top 10 in-demand shows right now, is going to go on for several seasons. Maybe, like, you introduce the new fandom, the kids, to, to the Federation through these, um, out from outside, you know, from just kind of learning about the Federation through its records or Janeway and stuff like that. But then at some point, you actually do bring them to the Federation and interact with it properly and, and just kind of slowly increase the levels of Federation of Starfleet that these cadets are. Then again, they are planning a Star Trek Academy show, aren't they? And I was going to say, maybe you could even have it where eventually they just go to the Academy. God, if, if there's a writing team who I think could do that, it's this one. But yeah, that, that would make Starfleet Academy, the show, kind of redundant, wouldn't it? Uh, forget Starfleet Academy. No one even remembers it. I made a video about its announcement and I don't even remember it. I want that. I want now maybe like season two or three. They just go to the Academy. That I'd love to watch that. Academy is probably the replacement for this show as well because it's a it's a younger audience's show. So when this eventually ends, Star Trek's planned out for the next six years, apparently, which was 2028. It used to be 2027, so he's added a year. The potential of going to the Federation is very interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if that's maybe how the series ends. I, it'd be really interesting to see it, like, come in midway through the show. And, and again, actually, you know, we're building up to quite a finale here. It almost feels like a season finale, really. But I, there's a, in my head, it's like, we've got 10 more episodes. You know, the Diviner thing might not be a, a series arc. It might just be, you know, a season one arc. But even then, what are the 10 episodes between now and the end of season one? And yeah, I don't know, which it's interesting. But man, am I looking forward to more Prodigy. Recency bias, of course, but it may even surpass Lower Decks in like the best current Star Trek. We did get interesting hints of the potential of a... Uh, a romance thing between Dal and Gwen, which I think I, I noticed in the beginning, I might have commented it, is somewhere they could go. Um, I didn't expect it. Uh, Prodigy doesn't need it. But um, it was the line where, I don't want to lose us. Don't look at me like that's the whole crew or something like that, which is a very, you know, almost cliched when you have the two characters in the team. It's like they, they love each other, but like they haven't admitted it. It's like us. I mean is in the team. You know, we've all heard that line a thousand lines before. It was also given in a way where, like, it might not necessarily be that. I wouldn't be surprised if they're kind of leaving the door open for, uh, eh, maybe we go there. I can't remember how old everyone is. I think Gwen and Dal are actually quite old. They might be a 14, 16 range, maybe even older. I mean, compared to the others. But I did think that was interesting. Well, again, to make a Steven Universe comparison, you could do like Steven and Connie, who were even younger. Was it 12 and 14? Maybe it was even younger at the start. But we're like, you know, kind of there, but also they're kids. Like, it's not, it's not really a thing. But yeah, I just found the potential interesting. The uniforms. Finally, I can make my proper logo. Finally, I can make proper thumbnails. A lot to talk about here. I I'm very curious to see the fan reception. I think they'll be a bit controversial, other than Discovery. Oh, and I guess Enterprise. Uh, but, but, but like, this is firmly in the Star Trek colors, colored uniforms era and totally doesn't do it. Kind of like the Voyager racing uniforms, as I call them. I can't remember the episode. It, when they went in the big race, Voyager entered a race, Delta Quadrant, they had white uniforms. Um, I, I'm kind of looking, it almost seems there's some inconsistency, or rather variation, you could call it, in the uniforms. I think there'll be a lot of praise on, um, they're very different for the different aliens, um, which is, of course, something that kind of has been absent in Star Trek. But beyond them just being aliens, uh, also the body shapes, like, you know, Rock Talk is quite a large individual. You'd never get a human who looks exactly like that. Um, Jane comes short and short, larger as well. Zero is just a sphere. I think they might have painted a uniform on in other bits, which is nice. But sort of the, there's a variation for all sizes and body shapes, species, everything, everything, yada, yada, um, which is a great... The, there's variation I could see. Some of the collars look different. It was hard to tell if that's um because of some of the larger aliens or with more, less humanoid shapes, uh, proportions, or if it's true variation. Janeway's got the biggest one who's got red command stripes um, going up and down their shoulders. Half of them, you can kind of tell right below the blue bit <laughs> there, um, 
they've got blue science division stripe is what it looks like. Not everyone has a division stripe. It, and it'd be a little weird if it is division and they're all science. Technically true is the Protostar an experimental vessel and if it's on some sort of archaeological scientific expedition, sure. But you still got like Jenkum Pog, um, Dal. I could see a blue. I'll have to look at a lot of the references to really do the logos and thumbnails, which probably won't come in by next episode. I'm just going to say it now. But yeah, I, I'm not sure, which is real hard for someone who has to draw the command red <laughs> for the thumbnails. But I quite like it. You know, it's definitely different, but I I think it's enjoyable. It I, It's definitely not something I would have come up with. I, I'm too attached to the red, yellow, blue. Uh, I can't quite tell if it's a white or a gray on the top. It's definitely a uniform to blend with the ship. I do get kind of feels of that experimental jumpsuit-y, um, almost like you could wear this to go out for a run kind of feel. It's it's definitely a more active uniform, if, if that makes sense. Just with the Protostar, I guess, being fast, it's experimental. It, it's that general test pilot personality, uh, the stereotype, I don't know if you'd call it. If you're not familiar with it, you could probably Google it, but it's think of like the Tom Paris figure, right? Test pilots are kind of the bowl. They'll do insane things. I mean, they're test pilots, you know? It's a, there's a mortality rate to that job. And, and even Detmer, you know, pilots in Star Trek and pop culture have often had the same personality. It kind of gives off those vibes, which definitely makes sense for Prodigy. And I think they look good in Starfleet uniforms, and it's definitely Starfleet. Even this awful picture I'm getting in my um, view cam, you know, the preview. Like, yeah, that's definitely a Starfleet uniform, despite just looking white. Um, there's more variation, of course, in the actual color. There's kind of a dark, dark blue, almost black undertone with a lighter gray bottom, the white top, and then the division stripe. Looking at this, Jenkum, Pog, Dal, and Rock Talk all have it. It's possible maybe, um, I, I swear some of them didn't in different scenes. Maybe it's just lighting because it, it is quite small. It could be hard to see in dark spaces. Um, there's the potential that maybe it's just a continuity error. They, there was a later edition or something. Uh, or I've just missed them and it was always there. Interesting is the sleeves are sometimes staggered down um, and not flush with the white on the top. It looks to be a body proportion thing where the arms are relative to um, the shoulder, the top. What's this part of the body called? The top of the chest? But both of them are interesting looks. Definitely gives me a lot of freedom and my partner for um, logo design. Now I think it's just dark in some scenes. They're obviously there on all of them. I know I'm blocking some people, but yeah. It, the divisions are definitely muted in these uniforms. But here you go, Janeway, you can see, you might see in there, has got red stripes on her shoulders, you probably noticed in the episode. She's also got a simpler uniform. In fact, it's darker at the top, no division stripe on the chest, and no darker section at the bottom. At first I thought maybe this is the Admiral variant, but she's always been Captain Janeway as a hologram, despite probably being an Admiral, in fact, certainly being an Admiral at this point. Look at scenes like that where I'm accidentally blocking Murph. Uh, like, it's it's a Starfleet crew. I mean, Prodigy's interesting because it's a ship. It doesn't quite fit in that lineage. You, If you take Voyager and extend it to Picard, uh, or rather Lower Decks to Picard, Prodigy doesn't really fit. But it's also an experimental vessel, and despite being so different, Orville-like is what I compared it to a lot um, before the show came out. That's from Starfleet, and these are not Starfleet races we see in any other show. I'll even show Murph now. I mean, I don't know. Is it the layout? Is it... It's a team... What it is, is it's a team that knows Star Trek. It knows what to keep, what to change, and I might know exactly... Not know exactly how far you can push these things. I, I realized recently... Not recently, but consciously, uh, Enterprise uniforms don't have a Delta. In the show, from what I briefly could tell, at least uniform-wise, never uses the Delta. And for the first time... It made sense to me why some people of the time, Enterprise technically was of my time, but I didn't watch it uh, when it came out contemporarily, why some people didn't know Enterprise was a Star Trek, despite having, you know, Vulcans and, I mean, I mean to me, it quite obviously is a Star Trek, but I understood it. And it's like, I didn't realize how critical the Delta was to Star Trek. Star Trek's at least visual recognition until then. But then, of course, you look at early Discovery, which for me has a lot of the same things. A lot When I first saw it, a lot of random sent some Discovery. I'm like, that could be any show, despite the Delta plastered everywhere. So, like, it's a weird, hard balance for any show, even fans, to see, like, exactly what is the essential bit and what you can, can you change. Uh, Doctor Who's reboot is an amazing example, because a lot of people were really trepidatious, fans even, 
the changes Russell T. Davis was making. But then when it aired, he's like, oh no, like, yeah, th- he's right. Those were very superficial, you know, concerns we were having. I honestly don't know if anyone has ever known a show better than Russell T. Davis and Doctor Who. And it's getting kind of vibes like that from the prodigy team and the set designers. They clearly know what can change and what can't to keep a Star Trek. I can't wait for the 14th Doctor and Davis's return. Here's interesting in this pan. I don't know if you can see it, but they actually have division stripings on their boot because I'm sure this is Dahl is wearing red. Gwen is wearing blue. Jinkum's either wearing yellow or red. He should be yellow as an engineer, uh, but that is interesting. What I actually wanted to point out though is all these shots like this that I, I'm sure it's intentional. There's a lot of heroic shots of them once they put in the Starfleet uniforms and very Starfleet, very moral. Lower Decks did a similar thing where, um, different but sim- um, for the same goal, where the bridge and the bridge crew, especially you can really see it in that first episode, are animated a bit better than everyone else. And there's a little bit more effort in terms of like lighting and to really make it look kind of like it's the special place the heroes hang out. And so it, again, the direction, um, another thing that's phenomenal in this episode, just kind of giving the sense, uh, even if you don't realize it consciously, unconsciously, it's the things of they've elevated themselves in some way. They're more than they were before upon putting on the uniform. Which again, it's not just about the uniform or joining the organization that is Starfleet. All that is symbolic in itself and always has been. All the Starfleet icon- iconography of um, the Starfleet values and the Federation values, which are always way more important than the organizations themselves. Again, just look at Discovery's Season 3. The Federation may die functionally in a lot of places of the galaxy, but the Federation values will outlive the Federation. And... In the end, they're the ones, they're the bits that matter. Here's what I was talking earlier. It's Jankum Pog who's kind of holding and Murph in zero suit, just like puppeting him around. Oh, I noticed as well, the Protostar had three landing legs when it landed here. So I don't know if the first time um, when I pointed out, it's called a leg to stand on, my review, because literally I was like, how ridiculous is it? It stands on one leg. I don't know if the um, writing crew went, yeah, that's ridiculous. Let's change it. Or more likely... They intentionally only lowered one leg at the beginning to show the crew didn't know what they're doing. And now, I guess the uh, protostar was tractored in, but like it was expertly f- flown, landed, like they know their ship now. And it's a lot of that uh, organic growth that maybe consciously you don't quite catch on, but it's some level you do see and you do notice. I will say though, um, you know, I, I do have to find some criticism. I am a Trekkie. It did feel a bit weird to have the big heroic putting on the uniform, which even before Prodigy aired, um, they never said, they always said, not necessarily literally doing it, and it may not even happen in season one, but they said at some point in their show's arc, a sort of putting on the uniform moment would be integral to be like, they, you know, they've become Starfleet values. And, and it was really kind of weird for me for Gwen to have that moment happen, and then so soon later have her kind of take off the badge and crush it or something, separated by a few episodes, um, you know, just a bit, get, get her some time to, like, live in the uniform and have it actually start to really mean something to her, and, or rather prove that it does to the audience, would have made this moment a lot more impactful. We do have it, like, they clearly understand Starfleet, where he's like, do you even know what that uniform resents? And she doesn't say Starfleet, she doesn't say the Federation, um, she doesn't even quote some regulation. I think her words are to strive for something better. Even without a formal education at Starfleet Academy, that's a great definition of what Starfleet is. You could go more detailed. <laughs> I would. I mean, look at how, like, ranty, not ranty, rambly my reviews are. Like, she, she clearly understands it, but it would have been good to have maybe an episode or two of, I don't know, almost the traditional Star Trek episode, but actually kind of done more Starfleet and really thinking about the values. Um, Like you can see, Dal had kind of his moment, um, not quite enough to define that, but before he was kind of, he even acknowledges it, like half-baked, running around, throwing stuff at the wall till it works. But then you have his pose debating things like the captain, just silently listening to his crew. And, uh, you know, Picard does it a lot. Picard's is more... Like this, you know, this is how Picard sits at meetings, just, it's, <laughs> but yeah, you know, they, they all, they all have their captain stance, and Dal's growing into, like, a captain, proper captain figure, as much as he can without training, like, really, when you think about it that way, 
um, and some of the stuff I've talked about Zora and really needing that training for responsibility. He's doing great um, without any academy training. Oh, I do kind of like the asymmetricalness of these uniforms of the front compared to the back. I like how the white's very much a highlight that draws your eyes to the top. I wonder if that's intentional, if it kind of, and almost a feel you have to look up at these characters, even Jankum, who's quite small. Like, Jankum is below my eye line, but I think that white gives me the feeling of I have to look up to him, which again is just a little thing. It's not a I'm better than you, but it, it's kind of a natural Tasha Yar's line of far point, this court should bow to what Starfleet represents. It's like the, the Starfleet and Federation values are so pure and utopian and the value, not the organization, is the values should be put up on a pedestal. And it's that little thing of being Starfleet is to serve those values. And serving those values is something that just puts you up just a little bit. Not above others, but it makes you something to be respected. Because when you put on the uniform, you represent those values. You're the face of those values. And I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it's just the little up is very nice. I now open the betting pools to how long until you can buy this for your Star Trek Online character. It's kind of funny though, especially with someone who hates the badge so much, where he's kind of like, he's like, take over this hologram. And he's like, all right, I'm just going to make it a bit goth, add some nice highlights, blue tinges on the badge. Keep that, but give it a nice blue shine. Yeah, put on the makeup and then just dramatically theme her. I guess actually she's, she kind of resembles the Diviner race. I'm um, still human, but it's their skin color, their hair color, or at least a natural hair color they have. Yeah, I, I, I imagine he might enjoy perverting that Starfleet image somewhat because of the big conversation I rant I just had about the uniform is the physical manifestation of the ideals. You can never touch the ideals, but you can touch the representations. And finally, I did quite enjoy the scene of like, all right, guys, we can stop pretending now they're gone. I don't actively try to predict the stories as I watch them a lot, at least not in the way that a lot of people do, where they'll kind of look at the narrative structure and things. I just like to sit down and enjoy something and watch something. Um, so to me, I never really picked on on like that that was their plan. As I said, I thought like, what was the original plan here, you know? So maybe it is more obvious if you do um, think about that sort of thing. Some people might call me an idiot. Um, it's more an intentional choice not to want to just notice narrative structure and go, oh, I know how this is going to end. Yeah, I I've always thought the best mystery sort of thing, the best plots are when this is your level un of understanding as the audience member and the cast, the crew, the whoever is trying to solve the mystery is either at your level, like, just in front of it, just in front of it is amazing when you can nail. I think season three of Enterprise was that. And if they're behind you, it's like you think of something and then the cast member says the line. Like, it should be a very close tie. And I think this episode of Prodigy was in a lot of ways. And bonus points, if you can do the Steven Universe thing of pull that off and then make me go back and be like, oh, those are the jetpacks they use that they're building in the montage. And there's other stuff I'm sure will become apparent in the second part as well. But that'll be a fun, this will be a fun episode and even a fun series, a great series to rewatch just like Steven Universe's first season. The whole thing, but the first season in particular. And I think that's it for the day. I finally found a way to ensure I keep these videos short, and that's to record them in the morning, forgetting I'm gonna wanna eat. I am very hungry right now, so can't wait for the second part. I mean, that was exceptional. Discovery's been pulling its own rate uh, recently with season four, and I think the, the last episode of Discovery was really good, but I mean, it's something where Discovery has to hold up to this. It's that sort of thing. Again, like season three with Lower Decks, Prodigy set a bar. And so I was, I was very much enjoying season four. You can watch my reviews. I mean, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm a fan of it now, but it, it's really setting a standard for the other shows and it's incredible. So thanks for watching. If you have to have made Prodigy, thanks thanks for making it. I don't know if they watch my reviews. I, I know that at least Aaron's aware of me very active on Twitter, but... Yeah, thanks for watching. If you made Prodigy, I'd love a part to <laughs> walk on part. But yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Can't believe I said that.